systemology is my secret weapon to efficient creative and productive thinking and action and it's allowed me to put the right things in my focus or my team's focus at the right time. Hello, it's David Jennings here from Systemology. I'm with Alison Rogers from Vocal Maneuvers. Um, maybe just to start, Alison, I know we're going to talk about Systemology and how you've applied it in your business, talk a little bit about the Catalyst program you went through. Um, but I'd love to just start by finding out a little, little about you and the business and the clients that you serve. Yeah, sure. It's the Maneuvers Group and it consists of three different companies. But the Vocal Maneuvers Academy is our education facet of the Maneuvers Group. And our vision is to empower your authentic voice and harmonize your voice, voice within the symphony of humanity. And our mission is how do we do that? We elicit your authentic voice through our unique programs of voice tra training and vocal coaching. And how do we harmonize that vital resource within the symphony of humanity is through our choral programs and ensemble training. So the Vocal Maneuvers Academy essentially is an extension of my personal mission, which is to honour and nurture the authentic voice within each and every person I come into contact with. And it's an absolute privilege to be working full time in an industry about which I'm passionate. Yeah. How long have you been in the space for? Beg your pardon? How long have you been in the space for? Yes, all my life. So I started teaching singing at 15 but my story actually starts a lot earlier than that so due to some unfortunate circumstances in in my family beyond our control um, I lost my father at a very young age I was five and I had a beautiful woman who lived two doors down from the home and my mum was left with five children under the age of 15 to care for and she did she was marvellous, a wonderful mum. But this woman who lived two doors down from me looked after me during the day and after school. Now, she was Welsh and she taught singing. And I sat in her studio all day, many days, colouring in and listening to her teach singing. And the transformations that she would achieve were enormous. And then when I was 15, she gave me the opportunity to run this junior choir and she was on the piano and she put me up the front to, you know, do the conducting. And after each session, she'd give me a critique on what I did well and what I could do better. And then she handed the reins to me and I was teaching singing and running choirs uh, as a sole trader until 22 years ago when it turned into a company. So all my life. <laughs> Yeah, perfect. And then uh, 22 years ago, that's when the Vocal Maneuvers company was launched. And then you've been running that for 22 years. Yes, I have. Yes. Yeah. And what sort of team have you got? I know you've got a range of people on staff and you've got mm. contractors and yeah, how many people are kind of involved in the business? Yeah, there's seven in the business in a regular capacity. It did wind down during COVID and we had um, that went down to two, and we're building that back up now post systemology. So systemology entered my life at a great time when I could really pick up the business and have a good look at it through the microscope and really work out the next iteration of it from an operational and business perspective. And then we have a number of um, permanent part-time who deliver the service and then a large number of contractors who perform in the business. Mm. And you've been in business for a really long time. And I know when you first start the, the business and you get it off the ground, you are everything. You will get involved in all aspects of the business. Uh, and I know it's easy at times to kind of fall into habits because uh, certain things will get reinforced that have worked for you, that have grown your business to a certain size. Uh, and then sometimes those things hold you back. Uh, I'm wondering if you have any insight into what some of the problems or challenges that were going on in the business prior to systemology and, you know, as you started to contract some of the staff off the back of COVID that kind of made you think, ah, yeah, I can see there are some areas here that I need to go to work. Firstly, I need to say 
I think the fact that I've never been an employee or worked in any other industry is somewhat limiting as well. So I've never seen typical workplace practice and I've never been an employee and that's neither good nor bad. I've just never been an employee. So I don't know how that feels. So reinforcing behaviours for me, it's particularly at the beginning when I, as, as your colleague, Mr Gerber would say, that entrepreneurial seizure, I think, isn't it? Where you just jump in and you have these great ideas and you achieve a modicum of success, which then reinforces a set of behaviours that during your state of entrepreneurial seizure, you've got it across the line, but it reinforces that behaviour, that that's what you have to do every time in order to create that result. And my experience was somewhat limited there in I don't need to be doing this particular sequence of events every time. And I was seeking something like systemology to open my thinking to possibility. I knew this could be done. I've not seen it done uh, in, in my industry. I typically see it as a place where people choose to dabble in a hobby, which is admirable in its own, but I wanted more as a business. And systemology's cracked that nut for me. And it wasn't an easy nut to crack, but you did it. <laughs> Were there uh, particular things like, the, and it's easy to look back, you know, hindsight gives you 2020 vision, uh, that you could see particular things that were going on that were holding you back like I know yeah. wanting to be involved in everything's part of it were, were there any other things that only became obvious to you now that you've got a bit more visibility yeah ignorance was the big one I was just ignorant to what what typical what successful workplace practice would have looked like um and yeah, I just feel I was, I was ignorant to what was possible and I just didn't know how. I knew what I wanted, but I couldn't I couldn't get the gap. I couldn't close that gap and I couldn't find what I needed to leverage what I thought I might have had a bit of intelligence and I couldn't in, I couldn't find the tools to leverage that and I kept falling into less intelligent ways of managing things, which is making yourself incredibly busy and not creating a saleable asset. And so with now the beauty of hindsight, I've sunk a lot of time and effort into this business and I want a tangible business that will provide well for my children and be part of their portfolio when I'm gone, if they choose to take it on or work in it or at least, you know, um, profit from it, I guess. Um, and looking back, I can, I get a bit disappointed with myself when I see some of the things that I didn't achieve as well as I could have. So, mm -hmm. yeah. You mentioned one or two of the things there around, you know, the amount of time that's gone in. I don't know if there's any other mm. things that jump out for you about like mm. the effect of that working, whether it's on yourself or on your team. Again, yep. just kind of looking back and thinking, Okay, that had this impact on either yourself or the team. Does anything jump out at you there? Yes. So the time invested was exorbitant. And then because you're doing it, you have an expectation of your team and your family that they would do similar. And it really strained your relationships with, with your family and with your friends and with your colleagues. Just excuse me a moment, Dave. I've just got someone at the door. I'm just going to go and see what's going on. Perfect. Sorry, Dave. I just get these beautiful ah. deliveries from my students. It's so lovely. Oh, it's a good time of year when that yeah, happens. It's one of the one of the perks of being a teacher. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just talking about that retrospective, the time and relationships and team. It's a big one, isn't it? So. Yeah. If you think back. Uh, prior to systemology and you think about the situation where you you're in um, and I'm not sure if it was before the purging with COVID or um, uh, prior to that uh, but kind of explaining or articulating your own position like 
Um, were you like working long hours or was there a particular stress or any sort of catalyst that made you really feel like, oh, you know, something's bubbling here and something needs to change? Oh, absolutely, which is why I sought out systemology. It was a constant state of heightened anxiety, um, always on tools, always working, burying my head in the in the sand, um, completion aversion, I'd call it. I just didn't want, didn't want to complete some things because the tasks were just so enormous in my head. And uh, it just it just impacts all aspects of your life, really, in a negative manner that you don't, I didn't want that anymore. And it got to the stage where I tried to kill my firstborn, which is my business. And that's when I knew I needed help. Yeah. Um, did you go on a search to try and find things to help? Or, uh, yeah. Like yeah. were there other things that you did try that didn't work or maybe they, they yeah. did help on the journey? What, what things did uh, you try? Yeah, I've tried um, work, work the system, carpenters work the system. I looked at that um, and did some of the, the free um, product offering in that. And I mean, I've looked at the e myth and have done some of the modules of that that training, the yeah. e myth um, technology. So it sounds like you and, had a sense um, that systems was the answer. Is that something that you mm. kind of already knew? Oh, this is part of what's missing, or was that something you had to discover? Systems set me free in my music so engaging in the scientific of systemizing in your music allows it frees up your thinking to be really creative the more elegant the more entrepreneurial the more intelligent intuitive side of me turns up when the scientific and the circuitry is in place so whether that's doing a piano concerto or coaching someone or writing a piece of music, when I've got the science in place, the art is extraordinary. And I think that's my secret. I don't necessarily think I'm better on tools than a lot of other people, but I think what gives me the edge is that my science behind my music is very sound. But the science behind my business wasn't sound. I'd never seen it in operation. I'd never seen it in any other industry. I consulted to conservatoriums of music um, as head of departments at these universities that have music um, faculties because there had to be somebody who was doing it and I couldn't find it. It was always just this, as you say, this amorphous blob of mm behaviors and anxiety and burnout and I wanted more because I knew I could get it in my art in my music mm. but I wanted it in the, in the business you mentioned about um the science uh in your music when you get down to what that is what what does mm. that mean is that mm. are you saying the science is yeah I, I'm, I'm not yeah. even sure yeah. I, I know what you mean by that so uh if we're contracted to do Beethoven's Ninth Symphony in the Singapore Concert Hall, the Esplanade Concert Hall, then what we have to do is chunk that down, that whole system. It, it, that becomes a very big project. And you look at the score and you go, right, it's in German, it's four-part vocals, and then you need to systemise your calendar so that the repertoire is covered. and the ABC actually did a documentary on a project that I did called The Curse of the Gothic Symphony, and they were a fly on the wall with me for about three years. And this symphony was called Cursed, or this documentary was called Curse of the Gothic because no one had been ever able to stage it. And because of the systems that I employed, it wasn't that I was, it was the the man who had my job, the job that I was engaged in before me was opera australia and then he chose not to continue with it 
So he's very skilled and very competent. And then it was a hospital pass really to me. And I picked it up and I had this ball. I'm going, how am I going to convert this goal? You know, I've got this thing in my hands. And it was purely systems. It was systems that, okay, you've got, you know, six movements. You've got to break it all down. You've got to get the practice tracks. You've got to recruit the people. You've got to train them. You've got to have all the sectionals. And that's all systemized for me. I can deliver that service. That service is beautifully systemized. And and where did you learn that? Because I love the fact it's almost, and I see this frequently in creative spaces, because sometimes there's a little bit of a mispatch. People think, ah, if I put systems in place, it's going to remove creativity. And I found in um, many creative businesses, the systems, as you've just identified, almost do the complete opposite. They they set you free. I'm curious to know where you had that discovery. Was that from the earlier teacher? Is that something else that you picked up? Like, where where did that systems thinking applied specifically in the creative space come from? I think initially, because I had outstanding teachers in those formative years of my life, initially what gave me the edge was my theory. You know, I knew what keys it was in. I knew the chords. I knew what the notes were. And that's what often would give me the edge. And so that's the scientific elements of music, you know, rather than the execution and the delivery. I think not that I am familiar with carpentry at all, but it'd be similar. They would know, you know, what the wood is and what the tools are and, you know, the hammer that they've got and, you know, all that sort of thing. I think that's where I learned that by watching those teachers and watching how they would work, I think. Um, Yeah. And it made me realise that that's what gave me the edge over, over people who were similarly as skilled as me, I think. Is that something that you were consciously doing or something that just happened and it's almost like you had an internal system that you were following it's intuitive and I thought everybody could hear what I hear and I thought everybody could do what I would do and uh, what I've learned later in life is to not be so outspoken about what I hear because now I realize that not everybody can hear the third of that chord is sitting is in tune, but it actually needs to be sharp to make the effect that they that they know, they relate to my work. That sounds so that that science that science of music really creates that heightened creative output. I I love the way that this. It's almost like a a metaphor for systems and the way that you think about them through the lens of music which is which is awesome well I think what we call it is that I think what I feel is that everybody looks at music as a horizontal focus you know you think if you're a soloist and you're singing it's note after note after note after note but when you enhance that vertical focus that's where I needed greater rigor and focus to get the outcome of like the Beethoven nine, you just can't do that horizontal. You've actually got to identify the department and then you've got to dig down into it to see what the stack is. Yes. And I think, you know, if we're singing Beethoven nine in Australia, where speaking German is not a, typical uh, language that everyone speaks here I've got to unstick that I've got to resolve it and I've got to move them forward productively so it's the same thing you've got to define your purpose and you've got to uh, paint for them the vision of the outcome and then you've got to organize it all into actionable steps that doesn't overwhelm them otherwise I'll just step aside and I think the people that work with me and the people that sing with me, so my customers and my colleagues, I have to be clear about what I'm doing. Um, I, ha- you know, they they love they love me to win because they know that they're going to win too. And I think if I tell them what I'm doing, I, this was the first conversation I had with James as well. 
that you have to be very clear and you have to provide that 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 clarity provides the juice and the direction and then you deepen that with your with your principles of action and the criteria for the excellence of conduct and I think that makes makes the difference so we have a system for visioning you know we've been given this brand new piece of opera that has to be put on stage at Sydney Opera House if I put that music straight into the hands of some of my customers particularly my new ones our education system they can't they can't read that like a book you and I'd be able to pick up a book in English and read it and they would too but we now teach them the systems so that they can pick up a piece of music and read it and hear it in their head without me playing it on the piano so the first thing we do when we get a new work is we articulate the vision or the outcome which gives them the blueprint for that final result so Mm -hmm. they know the what and I think you know you've got to be quite clear with that and then you you put it into action with them yeah and I think that's what's been really important with being successful artistically but I couldn't find that in my business yeah um and and you mentioned you tried uh, a few different things and it didn't quite connect when it came to systemology was there do you remember what first grabbed your attention? Was it a video yeah. or reading the book? Or... It was it was you. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> so what it is about you is that you, Audible actually suggested you to me. So that's yeah, how cool. I found out about you. It came up on my emails, books. You know how the Audible email you get and it says other things you might like? Mm-hmm. And I saw you and I went, oh, gosh, okay, what's this? They're recommending it to me. And you spoke about your father. And you spoke about the scorecard and the list. And I thought, this poor man is me sitting in singing lessons. It's part of your DNA, Dave. And as soon as I heard you speak, I went, this man's got the DNA in a skill set that I don't have. And I'm wondering whether it's because it was in my DNA singing-wise that I was able to identify it in you like that chart your dad did and you actually put a graphic of that in the book and I went oh this is this is priceless because I've got all the books of my singing teacher and I say Mm. things now I sound like her at times still you know and you must go I sound like my dad and you're doing it with your I remember you said you did it with your (laughs) eldest son and I thought oh man this man is me like in a different industry but an industry or a system or a pedagogy or a methodology that I know nothing of. Mm-hmm. And that's that's that was the trigger. Yeah. So um I did the the Michael Gerber and I read the book and I took copious notes and it was it's wonderful. But your packaging that book with the audible and everything was really great. And mm. then the catalyst. And I was so excited by it that I actually didn't want to outsource it to one of your systemologists to do, but I wanted to be handheld so I could learn more. Yeah. And it was, yeah, it was you because you live, drink, eat, breathe it. Like I reckon your everything in your life would be systemized or you would learn to do what I do. When I go to the supermarket and I'm pushing a trolley and I hear a caroler or music being piped through, I turn off my analysis. I don't go, oh, that's G major. Oh, now we're D. Oh, now we're going to E minor. I, I just have to turn that off when I'm pushing my shopping trolley. And I'm sure you're all the same when you walk into a shop or into a business or a service. I think you would know straight away what, what their systems or what their practice would be like, I would guess. I'm not at that stage, mm. but I guess you would be. It's, um, yeah, once you see it, it becomes very hard to unsee it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm like that when I hear a singer or even a person speaking, um, you know, you know, that's a tenor voice. Oh, that's a good tenor. Oh, that's a pair of good vocal folds in there. You know, I reckon you do the same with, oh, this is a good system. Oh, they've got that under control. Oh, there's a deficit here. <laughs> you know, They could benefit from enrolling in my course. So that's, that was, it was resonance from you leading your business which I think is great and that's hard to 
to capture now um, to leverage, I, I would think, because that's what it's like in my art form. But we're working out a way in which to leverage that. Mm, I, I think uh, the way that I look at business now, you know, I always want to be the best example of what it is that we teach. And I'm so proud of what we've been able to do with the Catalyst program, because when people first come into the world, they really want to be taught by Dave. But on on one hand, if I if it's always just me, then I, I'm not practicing what we preach. So um, as we've rolled out, you know, the first couple of Catalysts, um, I had run myself and then now, you know, it's, it starts to train the trainer and yeah. we've got the facilitator um, now. And I know you went through with um, James after you read the book, um, were you then thinking, right, I want to go deeper here. And like you said, I, I, you wanted to be a bit more hands-on. And so you thought, right, well, the systemologist might not be the right choice for me because I want to really integrate this deep into yourself because you, yeah. you had that connection. Yeah. Um yeah, I, I don't know. Were there, was there anything that made you think that the catalyst was the next step for you, or did anything happen in between? I know I've run some other programs here and there. What, yeah, what... yeah. Um, I reached out, so I read the book. I listened to the audible. Then I went back and read the book again, as you suggested, and made notes in Evernote or something with regard to that. And then I was watching a lot of your 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 digital work, your YouTubes and everything coming through, and it was becoming more ingrained. And then I had a one-on-one -on -one with one of your consultants, your sales team, and I signed up then and there and paid the full amount because I wanted to make that commitment to it. Um, mm -hmm. And that's that's what... That's what made it work because it was so tangible and so honest and not fluffy. And it just, and I'm quite skeptical of things and don't easily sign up for things or part with my money as well because it's hard, my hard earned money. But this, I went, yep, that's it for me. No installments, pay the whole lot, let's go and commit. So I think it was that whole. It was the way it progressed. It was the the audible. It was the book. Then I watched a YouTube of you in the Netherlands. And it's the fact that you're real. You're not trying to be something that you're not. And you're a little bit personally disparaging of yourself at times. It's relatable. Because I just go, oh, that's so me. That's because mm -hmm. I think, you know, and even with Gerber reaching out to you, in the early chapters of your book, you made me laugh because it's like some of the backing vocals with some of the world's top artists, the equivalent of the Gerbers in the performing arts world we've sung with. And I find myself going, why me? Why this little downtown Brisbane business? And it's I that resonated with me too because I thought that was humble and real and lovely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, did you have any reservations or anything? I know you felt quite easy to make that step, but mm. were there any doubts floating around in your head? Yeah, yeah. I think it's what you've articulated before. It's like you haven't got Dave. So this person who's facilitating in the Catalyst program has to be good. And that, you know, should I have tried that first or should I have had a meeting with him first or her first before parting with that? Um so that was the hesitation that I had, but none other. Your team were exceptional with following up. I hadn't returned some signed forms promptly and they followed up with, with courtesy and appreciation and understanding that particularly when you're doing something for yourself, you don't, because you don't put it in that urgent and important quadrant that Covey talks about. So if you're doing something for yourself, it usually gets pushed down a little bit lower in the hierarchy. But they were lovely with reaching out and just making sure that the loop was being closed. So you felt cared for. And that made me feel that my investment was valued and that felt good because that's what I do with my people if they sign up for things. I give them an extraordinary experience. I'm grateful that they put their trust and their money in me and I want them to have a wonderful time. And 
yeah, walk away saying, you know, that their vocal range has increased and they're able to sing ACDC or whatever. <laughs> but I want them to talk about their time with us as being priceless and never ending and the way in which they relate now with their authentic voice is what really matters. And systemology had that from the front foot and that was really good. So I felt cared and I felt like I was cared for and I was part of the fold. So that's really important. Mm -hmm. Did you have a particular goal when you came into the program? Like you're obviously like, hey, I want to get this systems thing. Did you have an idea of what outcome you were after? Yeah, my goal, and I actually have written it down. So I'll just pull up this goal because you gave me the technology for my goal. So there's actually, like I identify goals annually and um, they're broken down into areas of domain. And I've got one goal, that's, two goals that sit under this domain of systems and operations. And this goal says, systemize the VMA working procedures to create scale and leverage. And I say to myself, why do I, why do I want to do this? So this is why I, I enrolled in systemology. I want a lean, dynamic and replicable business that's geared toward maximizing income whilst producing or providing fulfillment, flexibility and freedom. That was my first motivation. And then my second one was systemization will create repeatable systems to manage the operations, enabling growth in a predictable and efficient way. It will ensure the business will handle growth as the customers roll in. You know, I'm in such a good situation where I've got these customers wanting to be enrolled and they say that they have to have a PhD in forensic science to find how to get into my business. <laughs> Um, automated workflows will free time to spend how I choose, i.e. working on in the business instead of nitty gritty of daily operations. And the final one was get it out of my head, exclamation mark. And I had to set time to focus on this business building and writing of systems. And then my next steps, and this goal has kept repeating year after year. And my next steps is so funny because it's gone from, um, a lot of software but I couldn't find the education so you know I spent a lot of money on software thinking that that's going to give me the systems and then I realized you know I could be playing a Steinway and still sound terrible until I had the pedagogy in how I depress the keys or how I ex you know expand against the keys so it wouldn't matter what piano you'd given me. It wouldn't matter what software I had. I still wasn't ending up with systems year after year. So I'm loving um, this. that's why I joined systemology. Um, when you went through the program, it's, it's a long program. Like it's for six months. And a big part of the reason that you joined it really is uh, hits the nail on the head like it, it's about taking this systems thinking really internalizing it making it the way that you see business the way that you do business and as a leader uh, the business owner and as your systems champion taking that uh, and then trying to almost like bottle it so that it can then be passed on to other team members I know there's a lot in the program but was there a particular favourite part or, or things that stood out for you when going through the program? You look back and you go, oh, I liked yeah. that bit. Yeah. So uh, as part of my enrolment, I also got that business systems accelerator. So I jumped into both. So I was doing it rather than on the fortnightly rotation, I really jumped into complete immersion in systemology. And I really carved out the time on the Tuesday mornings to do that, I had to shift things. But that was really stamped out as my time and no one dare interrupt me, not even my children. Like that was stamped out as my time because I was that desperate to get it right. And the things that stood out to me then were um, just so many things, but I have to say that what James Brown <laughs> did to me with regards to getting that CCF right 
was a game changer. And he, there was a lot of self-talk going on in my head that I really had to stamp out. And that's been there for years and I'm aware of it and I can identify it when it rears its ugly head. It's defiant. It's all things that have stood me in good stead as being, you know, a, a young business owner back in the day. And then here he was triggering it. And, and he was very clear, James was very clear about getting that CCF right. And he just kept, you know, I'd turn up the next week with the CCF and then it'd be like he'd handball it back and I'd have to go back. And, you know, you get you get angry and you get defensive and who does he think he is? But then you go, ah, oh, he's got it. He's, he's on to something here. And then I got the CCF right and things started to flow. And then James was insistent on getting a dedicated systems champion who wasn't doing anything else in the business. And I went, oh, I've got to recruit and I've got to find, I've got to interview. I don't have time for this. I'm doing systemology for a couple of hours every week. And now I've got to go and do this. It's just going to make systemology four hours, five hours a week on top of the homework. And I went, okay, I trusted him with the CCF. Now I'm going to trust him with this. And then you gave me the plug and play of here is the ad for your systems champion. And here is your position description. And I swiped it completely and just changed systemology for my business. And it snagged me the most incredible systems champion. And that was a game changer. And that was because of the self-talk in my head telling me this man knows what he's doing and he's getting the best out of me. He's like the best piano teacher. I always hated my best piano, like a love-hate relationship because they just knew how to get the best out of you. And that was one of my favourite, favourite times. Mm. James is a fantastic facilitator and I'm so glad that you got to work with him. Yeah. Is there anything that we might be able to comment on with regards to James, whether it's the type of support or help that you got from him or the ability to kind of push. We, we have some discussions at head office and, and I actually got this advice from uh, Michael Gerber. Uh, and I'm, I'm so glad that you, you've recognized it and you said, Hey, even though I might not be the person documenting this, I need to be the one that leads this and I need the DNA in me so that I can pass it on and I can stand behind it. And I had a line that Michael said to me once he said, don't let the business owner off the hook because that was yeah. one thing he felt in the systemology book that maybe maybe for my next book, I'll make it clearer um, that, you know, it, it almost sounds like, oh, you just handball this off to your systems champion uh, and they do it, but, but you need to still get it. And I think that's one thing that James and I talked about is, is really holding the the business owners and the team members that go through the catalyst program to that higher standard. And I don't know if you got that sense or if there's anything else yeah. from working with James that really stood out for you. Yeah, I really got that sense. And he really did hold me to that higher standard. And when that part of me starts the self-talk, that's when I know I've got to, there's something on the other side. I've got to go through it. I've got to trust. I've got to go through it. And James did that really well from the first session. So he was really well versed in the systemology, technology and culture and the way of doing things. He was, um, as understandably, anything in the virtual world, you know, or even on site goes pear shaped, but he's able to manage those things you know when technology drops out or whatever he just did that with grace and and calm and it wasn't like the world was falling in you know he just stepped through it and you know have a bit of a laugh at himself and and go on go on to the next stage so that was always lovely he was always never pretending to be something other than being a first class presenter but holding me accountable and getting that ccf right and getting that dedicated systems champion it's really been wonderful. I'm really grateful for that. Mm. And 
now that I'm not off the hook, because it would have been very easy to have handballed it to somebody else. And I was in that situation. I had an amazing person, a virtual assistant working for me for seven years, working with me for seven years. And after seven years, I'm up this, I'm over here and I wanted to be here. And he'd created all the systems and he was running it. And even the culture was becoming not what I wanted, not through any other means other than I wasn't directing him. He was doing the best that he could do, but it wasn't where I wanted to be. And I, I, I don't fault him at all. I don't know how he actually did it, to be honest, but after seven years, I woke up and went, what am I doing here? I want to be here. <laughs> and that's because I didn't keep my finger on the pulse. And now that I did the Catalyst program and I was able to do it myself and try it on for size, I'm going to be able to identify it in my team when something's not fitting properly because I've tried it on. Mm, I love that. One thing I've found as well, the further that I get down this journey for myself is um, when you first get started, the central philosophy for systemology is capture what you're currently doing, not what you would like to be doing. Yeah. And the whole purpose of that really is just to create enough space for the key team members, particularly the business owner, to then be able to work on it. Because most of the time, if there's not cash flow coming through and the person's just stuck in the day-to-day, -day, there's no visibility on that. But I actually believe the business owner does their best work by then pulling apart systems and re-engineering them the way they would like them to be, and then helping to have that inserted back in the business. Because that's that's what we try and often do with uh, systems is we're trying to capture the essence or the DNA of what the business owner is doing and making that transferable. So I think you've kind of got to that point already where you're, uh, you, you've created some space for yourself to be able to work on those systems and then have that installed into the machine that is your business. I don't know if you're, mm. you found that yourself as you've headed down this path. That's a really good point because you've prompted me to remember something else in the training, whereas I could have felt intense shame when the extractions were happening and when the rubber was hitting the road about how poorly my business was performing. So when we did the first extractions with the systems champion, what was brilliant about her was that she didn't stand in judgment because I had enough judgment for the whole business. You know, there are, it, it, you could actually be very disappointed in yourself and very embarrassed that, you know, your, that your business is able, up until systemology, it's able to perform at this level, which is wonderful. But when you start pulling it apart, like you just said, and you're doing an extraction and the systems champions trying to do an extraction on another member of the team. She tried to do a systems extraction on the salesperson on our team and she completely forgot to even tell her about the sales automation system we have in Asana. And, she, you know, she just totally forgot. To, and there's all these holes in every system. And so I, my... I'm really pleased that James was like with the cat of prod behind me. Why hasn't anyone done their homework? Where are the extractions? Where are the videos of the extractions? I strongly encourage you to get in as clumsy, but do your extractions. And that's when, you know, I got this, oh gosh, my business is so poor and underperforming. I had to stop and think I've achieved so much. Let's just do that extraction. Stay out of judgment, please, wonderful systems champion. Let's just do this extraction and fuddle through like Mr. Magoo and get it, complete it, document it, load it. And then because she's my capture system, I trust her. She's got the technology with the system hub. She's got the methodology with the systems extraction. She's captured. Then I'm able to extract that little piece that's completely broken and work on it while she's doing the rest. 
you know, there's a form, a Google form that's needed or a, a payment or, a, or something else or another appointment or there were other things that needed to be fixed. But that advice, capture it as it's currently happening. Draw a line under the sand and say, uh, under the line, a line under it and say, that's where it is. Broken, dead in some cases, not functioning, totally dysfunctional. Own it, be proud of it. Allow your systems champion to hold that space for you as the business owner. For the first time in my life, I've got this person working with me. He's holding the space while I pull the broken little pieces out and start working them. And that's that was fantastic. But the potential, you would possibly, there were times where I'd probably prefer to run and hide and pretend I was too busy to do systemology rather than face the pain of how broken elements of my business was, because that was painful. Mm -hmm. I think the more that you start, as you found addressing the the little broken bits as well over time, and you fix those and then you move on and it's got a, a cumulative effect. And then you're able to slightly start solving higher and higher problems, which is a better and better use of your time with, with that foundation in mind, if we kind of think about, you know, the future and the direction, the course of the business, I know you've already achieved some significant change. And if, if any of those things stand out for you, either that's already happened or that you can see is going to happen. I don't know if you can comment to kind of the future direction and then the impact of these changes. The future direction for my business is that the day to day, and the currency of the education, my education part of the business, the training part of the business is going to have greater reach. It's, it's systemized and it's delivering an outstanding product to a lot more people because what I possess in delivering the service is um, at a at a higher level now doing my PhD in that area of music. Um, it's a very boutique area. But my team who started with me as students when they were five, six and seven and are now, you know, 20, 25, they're able to teach. They know my philosophy. They know my education. They're able to teach it. But I couldn't put the tools into their hand to teach it so the future for the business is that education component is going to be able to reach more people that's not Allison centric there's going to be a standardization standardization in the in the product and the delivery of the product and that unique way of how we do things in the vocal maneuvers academy which is then going to free me up to systemize these things that are less regularly occurring, but are what actually sets our business apart. So, you know, in the six months of doing systemology, we had performances in all of the premier performing venues in Australia, except for the Opera House in the six months, with anywhere between six to 40 people at any time. And they, those events don't happen often, but they're the events that people want to come and do their education in because they want to go and do these great events. So they want to train to be the best possible so they can play in the A grade. And then that will allow me, by having all this, I'll have critical mass because of systemology. I didn't have critical mass to fuel the events everything would break down here. There'd be loss of income. I'd have to put that bread and butter education cash flow cow to sleep while I would go to Perth or I'd go to Tasmania or I'd go to Adelaide. Now with systemology, the future for the business is this just hums along like the most beautiful machine. There's no concerns with um it they're not being a system to address a, a challenge which will then 
allow us to leverage into these other events with confidence without everything falling down. And that's the future for the business as a result of systemology. I know I see this a little bit where sometimes business owners, if they've been in a business for so long and they get stuck in that rut and that way, they start to lose some of their entrepreneurial juice. And that's like part of the magic of what a business owner has. And as as they start to lose that, that's that's really sad. I, I feel I, I have seen at times where systemology will, it's like it awakens that part in a business owner again, because they can now see the path and they can see how there'll be a a cumulative effect of the work that they're doing as opposed to, again, just be stuck in, you know, the routine of doing the same thing, same day in, day out for years on end. I don't know if you have any feeling to that. Um, Yeah, I do. I do. I, I feel, I like to think there's a part of me that's intelligent and I like to think there's a part of me possibly a bigger part of me that's less intelligent. And I'm not saying that's because of education. It could be that I'm exhausted or burnt out or tired or I'm a mum and I've got, you know, and that possibly can at times be a bit foggy and a bit cloudy. So systemology has given me tricks to leverage that less intelligent part of me when I need it. It's that metaphor, isn't it, that... um, you know, if you need, if you if you need to take something the next day to work or out the door or whatever, or don't forget to take uh, a piece of hardware with you, or, or a calculator, for example, you put it at the door or you put it with your keys, so that when you wake up in the morning and you're just groggy from sleep, you don't need to think about it. It's there, and that's what a system systemology gives me. If that makes sense, so it leverages. I think less intelligence possibly a bit harsh, but there are times where you're just not in the zone. And I think that's human nature, isn't it? Because, you know, they say that, you know, we're supposed to be having these emotional experiences. We're not robots. And systemology is leveraging that part of me. So I don't have to think about where have I put that or where, do, where am I, where is that? It's just there now. And the same with a system for, you know, enrolling or onboarding a new student. I don't have to think about, well, where did I put their phone number or what's their parent's name or have, it's just in the system now. So that if any of us are feeling particularly tired after a big event or, you know, whatever, whatever force of nature is going on, we can trust that the system has it captured and covered and, you know, we don't need to give it any more thought. I could do it or one of the team could do it. I like that. It's almost like a it's a collective intelligence, which then means someone else might be onboarding that particular customer and saving that phone number somewhere. And then yep. you have the trust to know, well, now I can go in and this is where it should be. And if it's not there, hey, guys, we need to retrain on the system. It's outlined here. Or if it's not in the system, great. Well, let's now add that in the system so it is there for next time. So it kind of it gives a great way for managing staff and, and improving. I think um, like in the tail end, we, we touched on so many amazing insights. And I just love the fact that you've got this creative background and then you kind of, we get to see this through the, um, you know, the, the systems through your creative lens. Um, are there any final things, yeah, that you might, I don't know whether it's something, if someone was thinking about applying systemology to their business, something you might say to them or any final thoughts around systemology or or really anything. I think systemology is my secret weapon to efficient, creative and productive thinking and action. And it's allowed me to put the right things in my focus or my team's focus at the right time. And I think it's a fantastic way to enhance what you're currently doing. And you acknowledge us as business owners from the outset. You congratulate us on what we've achieved so far and that we're feeling an element of pain in order to be searching for more. But I feel the systemology has enhanced the productivity by giving me 
these trusted tools now and we actually all love to use them. We all talk CCF and DRTC and SAS and MBS and everything now. Um, and I think that's what's happened with us with implementing the systemology method. Um, and there were times where I was resisting it and I was resisting that whole process of streamlining the CCF but I appreciate now that it through the catalyst pro program I have a critical client flow and I'm able to replicate that for every service that we offer that's fast functional and fun really you know they're clear and they're not fancy words or something that's just specific to that product I think you say it sometimes it's it's just as simple as take money collect money that's what it is it's just collect money and I'm like oh no it's got to be this it's got, no it's just you're just collecting money that's the system and that's that's critical and I found I was resisting a lot of that at time I was, it's too simple it's too simple mm -hmm. and you break it down very well into the primary systems of the critical client flow what are those primary systems that you're currently doing for which you're being remunerated? And I was really surprised at the amount of remuneration I was receiving with a broken CCF. And then looking at the secondary systems, which, I'm, which is more like, so the primary systems of the CCF are like the skeleton. And, you know, you need that to actually build the body. And then with the secondary systems of that minimal viable system, I'm watching that profitability climb up and I'm able to tweak a few things now for next year that's going to see significant significant elevations in our, in our productivity. And there's been a significant improvement in our uh, financial profitability even in the six months of doing the program mm, wow i i absolutely am thrilled to hear your story and i think um it, it's almost like once we drop a, a rock in this lake the ripples go out I, I feel like we might need another part two i'd love to circle back in a year or two and see what changes happen because we've just we've adjusted a course now and you've yep. got the right tools to keep adjusting and stay yep. on track. And I think, uh, yeah, what's ahead of you uh, is going to be just magical to watch and inspiring for other business owners. So thank you so thank much you. for your time and, and generosity and um, yeah, absolute pleasure. No, you're very welcome. Thank you. Um, again, if anybody wants to find out a little bit more about you, is it best to just head to the, and I'll put a link near this, um, but just mm. the VMA uh, or the vmacademy.net.au, is that the best place for them to go? Yes, that's fine. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Alison. Thank you. Bye now.